right, ladies and gentlemen, we, are, we might make a start now. Thank you. Welcome to the ACT branch of the Australian Institute of International Affairs. My name is Heath McMichael and I'm branch president. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet and pay my respect to our elders past and present. I'd also like to acknowledge uh, uh, some of our friends in the diplomatic uh, community here, particularly from uh, Indonesia, Malaysia and Singapore, and welcome them. Also, uh, uh, staff from the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, welcome, and uh, many other former members of those departments. Now, before and uh, in fact, since the March summit in Melbourne to commemorate 50 years of ASEAN-Australia relations, uh, we've heard a lot about uh, ASEAN, and that makes uh, makes good sense. After 50 years of getting to know one another, it's high time that we ask how ASEAN is travelling. One perspective uh, has usefully been provided recently by Nicholas Moore in his foreword to a report he did for the Australian government on economic links with the region. He said, and I quote, while the countries of our region are extraordinarily diverse, what unifies them is their keen sense of being neighbours, including the importance they attach to strong regional architecture centred on ASEAN. So the concept of ASEAN centrality is there. It's also a focus of the Melbourne Leaders' Vision coming out of that, that meeting I mentioned, which calls for open, inclusive and transparent rules-based regional architecture in the Indo-Pacific. So tonight, uh, we're going to be very interested to hear from our distinguished panel on ASEAN's regional and economic priorities and what part Australia can play in achieving the association's lofty goals. Our panel for tonight comprises three leading ASEAN heads of mission here in Canberra who are well placed to comment. Their Excellencies, the High Commissioners of Malaysia and Singapore and the Indonesian Ambassador. We're asking them to speak for around 10 minutes each and then take questions from the floor and from our online participants. So we aim to finish by 7 p.m. First of all, we hear from our, our Malaysian distinguished guest, then from Singapore and Indonesia. And I'll say a few words of introduction to each one in turn. So to begin with, uh, let me introduce High Commissioner Sharina Abdullah, who is a 30-year career diplomat in the Malaysian Foreign Service. She has served as ambassador to Senegal and Switzerland and in the National ASEAN Secretariat in Malaysia. She's a graduate of Southern Illinois University and uh, she presented her credentials in Canberra in November last year. So without any further ado, if I could ask uh, Ibu Sharina to begin. Well, thank you, Heath. Um, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests. Um, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Mr. Keith McMichael, the um, ACT branch president of the Australia Australian Institute for International Affairs for inviting us, the ASEAN um, Heads of Mission, to participate in this program today. Um, I'm happy to be here, uh, and I'm sure my, my colleagues are too. Um, we are part of what we call the ASEAN Committee in Canberra, ACC for short, um, established in ASEAN to promote um, ASEAN's interests and ident in identity um, in the respective um, host countries. So um, therefore, it's um, an honor to address um, you today at the um, AIIA. Our discussion centers on a topic of immense importance, um, ASEAN's role in the Indo-Pacific, partnering with Australia for economic growth and security. The Indo-Pacific region, home to more than half of the world's population, is, a dynamic and, is dynamic and diverse. It is characterized by a rapid economic growth, significant geopolitical shifts, um, and a complex web of security challenges. Within this context, um, the ASEAN is, a ASEAN is a critical player, not only in fostering regional stability, but also in driving economic development. ASEAN and Australia, as you have mentioned earlier, uh, marked the 50th anniversary of dialogue relations with a special summit in March this year, reaffirming our commitment to the comprehensive strategic partnership, recognizing that our prosperity, security, stability, and economic futures are intertwined. <clears throat> Leaders from both sides 
have committed to enhancing economic architecture to improve regional living standards and resilience. Highlighted by Australia's focus on boosting trade and investment with Southeast Asia, Southeast Asia as encapsulated in Australia's uh, Southeast Asia Economic Strategy to 2040, known as the Moor Report. Now, ASEAN with its 10 member states re represents a formidable economic block. Collectively, we, count, we account for a GDP of over 3 trillion um, Australian dollars, making ASEAN the fifth largest um, economy in the world. Our markets are vibrant and diverse, offering vast opportunities for trade, investment and innovation. In recent years, ASEAN has made significant strides in economic integration, evidenced by the ASEAN Economic Community, which aims to create a single market and production base, a highly competitive economic region, and a region fully integrated into the global economy. Australia has been a steadfast partner in this journey. Our economic ties are robust and growing with bilateral trade between ASEAN and Australia exceeding 150 billion Australian dollars annually. The ASEAN-Australia-New Zealand Free Trade Agreement has been instrumental in this regard, reducing tariffs, <laughs> facilitating trade, and encouraging investment flows. Furthermore, initiatives such as the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership, or CPTPP, and the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, or RCEP, underscore our shared commitment to an open, inclusive, and rules-based trading system that you mentioned earlier. Um, economic growth, however, can only be sustained with a stable and secure environment. The Indo-Pacific region faces a myriad of security challenges, ranging from territorial disputes and maritime security issues to terrorism and transnational crime. In addressing these challenges, ASEAN has consistently promoted the principle of dialogue, cooperation, and the peaceful resolution of disputes. Australia and ASEAN share a common interest in maintaining regional peace and security. Our cooperation is exemplified through mechanisms such as the East Asia Summit, the ASEAN Regional Forum, the ASEAN Defence Ministers Meeting Plus. These platforms provide invaluable opportunities for dialogue and collaboration on security matters, uh, enhancing our collective ability to address both traditional and non-traditional security threats. Um, then we have what we call the ASEAN Outlook on Indo-Pacific. Um, the ASEAN Outlook uh, on Indo-Pacific was adopted in 2019. That document reflects our vision for a peaceful, stable, and prosperous region. It emphasizes ASEAN centrality in promoting an inclusive regional architecture, fostering cooperation across key areas such as maritime security, connectivity, sustainable development, and economic integration. Australia's support for the AOIP is crucial. By aligning our efforts with the principles outlined in the outlook, we can enhance strategic trust, promote mutual respect, and reinforce the rules-based order that underpins regional stability. As we navigate the complexities of the Indo-Pacific, the partnership between ASEAN and Australia stands as a beacon of what, we, of what can be achieved through collaboration, which will respect and shared aspirations. Our economic and security interests are deeply intertwined and our collective efforts will be pivotal in shaping a future that is prosperous, secure and inclusive. So I've repeated that line a few times that shows the importance mm -hmm. that ASEAN places on these three, um, pros prosperous, secure and inclusive. Um, as some of you may be aware, Malaysia will assume the chairmanship of ASEAN in 2025. We are currently undertaking the necessary substantive and logistical uh, preparations. We look forward to welcoming our partners 
and friends from within and beyond the ASEAN region to Malaysia next year. 2025 is a special year for ASEAN as it will celebrate the decade of the formal establishment of the ASEAN community. So in addition, ASEAN will also adopt um, the ASEAN Community Vision 2045, which will set the long-term strategic direction um, of the association for the next 20 years. As the incoming chair of ASEAN next year, Malaysia will place greater emphasis on people who are the nucleus of the, of the community. The broad overarching focus on the people is indeed reflective of the regional ethos and aspiration towards realizing a truly people-centered community. Given the pressing need to strengthen ASEAN's unity and centrality against heightened global contestation and fragmentation, Malaysia will steer ASEAN towards promoting strategic trust and mutual confidence among countries through continued dialogue, diplomacy, and goodwill. On the economic front, uh, focus will be directed towards strengthening ASEAN's commitment to a greater intra-trade and investment. The focus will be on developing a thriving ecosystem by harnessing ASEAN member states' comparative advantage and leveraging on an innovation-based economy. Malaysia will also steer ASEAN to, for to foster robust trade diplomacy and strategic arrangements with other regional countries and economic blocks as ASEAN endeavors to be a future-ready economy. Anchored on sustainable growth and good governance, future-driven and high-quality economic drivers of growth, such as digital economy and green energy, will be further mobilized. Malaysia's focus will also be directed towards promoting a culture of sustainability in all its dimensions that benefit the society while respecting the environment and the needs of future generations. This will be aimed at reducing development gaps and inequalities, improving living standards and human capital, as well as fostering social cohesion and participation. In closing, let me reiterate Malaysia's commitment as part of ASEAN to deepen our partnership with, with Australia. Together, we can harness the opportunities and address uh, the challenges of the Indo-Pacific, ensuring a brighter future for all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think the High Commission has given us a very good uh, general overview there of the issues in ASEAN and with Australia. But let's uh, turn now to um, the Singapore perspective. And, uh, we're very pleased to have with us High Commissioner Anil Naya, who was appointed High Commissioner of Singapore to Australia in July 2022. He joined the Singapore Foreign, Minister Foreign Service in 1993 and has been Ambassador to Indonesia and to Belgium, where he was accredited to the Netherlands, Luxembourg and the EU. He was the co-agent for Singapore's case before the International Court of Justice, on the Pedra Branca territorial dispute, which he received the Gold Public Administration Medal in 2008. So, High Commissioner, please. Thank you very much, and a good evening to all our friends uh, from the AIIB. Thanks for joining uh, us, uh, my very illustrious colleagues here, on this cold, wintry Thursday um, <laughs> evening. So, I hope the discussion will warm things up a bit. Um, again, on the topic of weather, last week I was in uh, Darwin, the Northern Territory, and whether it's from a climate standpoint or whether it's from a cuisine standpoint, if there was any doubt that Australia is indeed an important and integral part of our region and a neighbour of Southeast Asia, I think that's the place where it really came to um, for someone like me, at least. And if you look at the origins of ASEAN and you trace it forward to the time when Australia became an important and the first dialogue partner to ASEAN in 1974, it was, uh, to put it mildly, a very tempestuous and tension-filled period, uh, 1974. Lots of things going on in our part of the world because of the Cold War. 
lots of things going on here in Australia itself, domestically, uh, as I'm sure many of us uh, will know. So out of that very tumultuous situation was born this dialogue partnership, close relationship. And today we are at a stage where that relationship has been upgraded to a comprehensive strategic partnership. And Australia is indeed a very important and critical stakeholder in the direction that ASEAN will take going forward. Uh, Sharina was very kind to share with us a lot of important statistics and data, but just to make one additional point to that is, of course, that in two-way trade between Australia and uh, ASEAN, uh, we, were, we are on a clear upward trajectory, and it has already reached uh, $70 million. Now, many of us feel, and I'm sure this is a view shared in Australia, as evident by uh, the Moore report, um, this is a number that is big, but it has the potential to get a lot bigger. And I think that's our responsibility to make sure how that happens. Uh, of course, we welcome Australia's continued interest to deepen linkages with ASEAN, both with the, on a bilateral level with the, with the countries, as well as on a regional basis. Implementing projects going forward in priority areas identified under the strategy, such as green economy, green energy transition, um, I think will be a very important part of this relationship between Australia and ASEAN. And on a bilateral front, of course, we hope to deepen linkages uh, on a business-to-business -business basis under the bilateral Singapore-Australia Green Economy Agreement, which will include the establishment of a green digital shipping corridor between our two countries. And we hope these will all be pathfinders which can be extended to our other friends uh, in our respective regions. Uh, needless to say, an important foundation in this relationship is the very close people-to-people -people contact that we have between Singapore and Australia. Uh, for Singapore, at least thousands of our um, senior civil servants, uh, political office holders, business people, and so on. Uh, to them, Australia is in many ways, outside of Southeast Asia, a second home. It is a place that they are most familiar with. And as I speak, uh, there are at least, there's at least one Singapore police, uh, political office holder who is enjoying his midterm uh, holiday with family here in, in Australia. Um, so at any given point in time, it's a, it's a relationship at the people-to-people -people level that I think is strengthening, and it will be an important foundation in our relationship. Now, the phrase that is most commonly used when talking about ASEAN is ASEAN centrality. What is it actually about? Uh, is it about ASEAN being in the center of everything, dictating things, providing leadership? It can mean different things to different people. From at least the Singapore standpoint, I think it's a view that is shared by some of our friends in ASEAN as well. Our critical role when you talk about ASEAN centrality is to provide an additional pillar, an additional foundation for regional stability and security. And this is not something that we can take for granted. Uh, if you look at the history of our region in the 1960s and 70s, the diversities in terms of ethnicities, cultures, religion, political systems, socio-economic development, these were not a, a source of strength by any measure. In fact, they caused a lot of problems between us. But learning from those lessons, it has become very important for us to see how we can use that diversity to make it into uh, a pillar of strength for our region, not just for ourselves, but of course to engage our other friends and partners. Now, transforming that diversity from a potential challenge into a potential and clear strength has been a very important aspect uh, in why ASEAN and Southeast Asia has been able to enjoy several decades of stability. And that, in turn, has injured peace, trade, and prosperity for all of us. Uh, our ASEAN friends together, uh, new members as well as old members, what we share is a vision for shared prosperity. And this is critical. We can have uh, hundreds of meetings, a plethora of meetings at every level you can think of at the ASEAN level, but it is completely pointless if the average ASEAN citizen in these countries says, what's it all got to do with me? How does ASEAN make 
any difference to my life, especially in a positive way. So I think this remains a critical uh, part of the ASEAN story. How do we make sure that the citizens in each and every ASEAN country continues to benefit from their country being a member of ASEAN and using that membership to engage our other friends and partners uh, in the rest of the world. Now, since the establishment of the ASEAN free trade area, for example, we have seen GDP growing from 1992 uh, from US uh, $600 billion to $3 trillion today. Again, the challenge remains for us. How do we make sure that this growth and this development is shared with the people of ASEAN? To borrow uh, the words, or uh, to borrow something that my former Prime Minister, Mr. Lee Sien Lung said, uh, ASEAN is the raft, or the raft, to which we are all connected to. And I think this remains important for the countries in the region. Um, but of course, looking at where we stand today in the inter broader international context, as well as looking ahead, uh, we live in a challenging time, as was the 1970s, when we first had established our dialogue partnership with Australia. We live in a very challenging time because uh, in addition to the problems and challenges that we all face domestically, uh, we are living in a time of nationalism. Uh, nationalism, not just in terms of helping my country to do well, but in some cases, helping my country to do well at the expense of others. So we are living, unfortunately, in a mood of that kind of nationalism, protectionism as a source of, uh, as a solution to some of the challenges that we face. And we are at a stage where there is a real possible that there will be economic and technological bifurcation. Now, in a situation like that, trade and investment flows, which have helped all of us to develop and grow and be connected, will come under severe strain. This is a challenge that uh, all of us face, and it is not a challenge that can be tackled sheer by sheer economic logic, but it can only be tackled by continuing to develop the strategic trust, uh, shared interests, and the people-to-people -people relations that are very important. That's the only way that we can prevent uh, our respective regions and many, many other countries in the world to fall into the, the siren call for solutions which come from the past to challenges that we are going to face or that we are already facing today. Uh, so ASEAN centrality in that sense will be critical in terms of facing some of these challenges that we face. Together as a region, I think it will be very important for us to look at challenges such as climate change, energy security, aging societies, which all of us face, uh, and the rapid technological change that we are facing today, which can, of course, uh, create a lot of upheaval in our respective uh, socioeconomic systems. Now, how are we going to ch challenge these uh, long-standing, these deep-rooted socio-economic and political challenges, if we try to look for these solutions domestically or nationally, I think it would be very challenging. There has to be a form of consensus building between within ASEAN, of course, and between ASEAN and our friends and dialogue partners uh, elsewhere. Now, this is not something that is new for ASEAN. Uh, we have dedicated forums with our partner countries, and our partner countries include US, of course, China, Japan, Russia, India, Australia, um, and we have forums such as the East Asia Summit and the ASEAN Plus Three. Establishing forums like this are not necessarily derived with the objective of solving big problems. Um, I think ASEAN knows its limitations, uh, and it is fully aware of how far it can go. Sometimes uh, wanting to do something effective uh, can lead us in certain directions which create more problems. And knowing one's own limits, trying to find that balance, avoiding overreach is very, very important part of the ASEAN story. So ASEAN, by bringing together all these different countries and different dialogue partners and friends and partners, forms a kind of natural multipolarity, which allows all of us or the member states dialogue and dialogue partners to maximize the options available to tackle some of the challenges that I've highlighted and also for us to grow together. 
Um, now, just to end off, I would say uh, the relationship between ASEAN and Australia has been obviously a very good one, a very strong one. We have both benefited from it. And I think it is really heartening to see that despite changes in government here in Australia over the years since 1974, despite all the political, uh, domestic politics that you find here in Australia, as you find in any other country, almost seamlessly as if in a relay, the baton has been passed from one administration to another in terms of building on what was established and strengthening the relationship with ASEAN. That's really something heartening for us to see from our part of the world. Um, some suggestions, of course, uh, some ideas in terms of what else and what more can we do. Uh, ASEAN, of course, we hope uh, Australia will continue to participate actively in all the ASEAN Plus me mechanisms, including the East Asia Summit, because Australia's ideas have been critical and will continue to be critical uh, in terms of the stability of the Asia-Pacific region. We also hope that the Comprehensive Strategic Partnership will provide a foundation to do more together in some of the areas that I've outlined uh, at the start of my short presentation here. In terms of the green and digital economies, that will be critical. In terms of uh, human capital development, infrastructure, uh, these are also areas where, of course, we, we know that Australia has uh, clear strengths. On the green economy, of course, uh, Australia has stated its objective to be a renewable superpower. So this is a journey in which I think you will find that there will be many willing fellow travellers in ASEAN, uh, and together we can co-create clean and sustainable uh, energy solutions. Uh, within ASEAN, we have always talked about the importance of an ASEAN power grid, because there is no way that ASEAN can continue to grow unless we really take a deep and clear and realistic look of, at what we need to do on the energy front. So it is critical, uh, I think, for us to work with our friends and partners like Australia to see how we can strengthen our access to green energy. Uh, I think this will allow our region to be more interdependent in a positive way and to be more competitive as well uh, globally. Of course, on the digital economy front as well, uh, connecting digital finance systems is going to be a very important part of the story for many countries and, of course, Australia and ASEAN uh, will be no exception to that. And again here, Australia's strengths in digital, uh, in the digital economy space, uh, in terms of uh, artificial intelligence and cybersecurity will be a very important asset for us uh, to work on. I will, I will stop there, uh, but I think um, to, it's apt for me, I think, to end uh, whatever I've said, if it doesn't register, but at least I hope one point that will register is what uh, the Prime Minister of Australia himself has said, which is that when our region prospers, Australia prospers as well. So with that, I would like to end my short presentation. Thank you very much. Well, thanks very much, uh, High Commissioner, for your frank insights there. You've covered a lot of ground, but I'm sure there are still some fresh perspectives from our third speaker tonight uh, from Indonesia. And we're very pleased to welcome back to the Institute, to the ACT branch, Ambassador Siswo Pramona, who has been Indonesia's ambassador to Australia and Vanuatu since December 2021. Previously, he was head of the Indonesian Foreign Minister Ministry's Policy Analysis Agency, where he developed Indonesia's position on the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific, we've mentioned that tonight. Uh, Pasiswo served as Deputy Chief of Mission in Berlin and advisor to the Indonesian Mission to the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons in, in the Hague. He and his wife, Marcia, have PhDs from ANU. And so, please, Pasiswo, the you. floor is yours. <laughs> yeah, so uh, it's, it's good because my colleagues already covered a lot, uh, Mbak Sarina and Mas Anil. So uh, just a little bit on adding one or two. Uh, the topic of our discussion today is ASEAN, Australia Partnership for Growth. And many in ASEAN is really obsessed with growth and growth is good, yeah. And with growth, uh, we depend on the partnership which Pak Anil already mentioned. So the situation like this, in ASEAN, uh, growth is much depend on our export and the inflow of FDI investment. 
FDI mostly coming from United States, our export goes to China. So that's why we need both partner, United States and China. Yeah. So this explains by itself the position of ASEAN uh, on that situation, on the competing power between the United States and, and China. Now, uh, to growth, we need a security. And uh, I think uh, Sarina already mentioned all the uh, ASEAN uh, robust you know, architectures, uh, uh, ROIP as an outlook on Indo-Pacific and so on. But for Indonesia, it is important to make all the thing into project. So when we chair the ASEAN, uh, in 2023, we have the uh, the the uh, the IP forum, uh, ASEAN forum on uh, uh, in the Pacific, yeah. And we managed to have 93 uh, 93 project. And the good thing about the project, we see not only uh, advanced countries like UK or France investing in ASEAN, but ASEAN start investing in other ASEAN countries. This I think is a, a good progress because in the past we trade one to the others. But now we start investing one to the others. It's give up more security. Uh, the largest investor in Indonesia, after all, is Singapore. Yeah, uh, <laughs> America number four. Yeah, so, uh, Hong Kong number three, and China number sometimes uh, three, sometimes two. Yeah. Now uh, this is important to see uh, how the uh, uh, the companies and economic activity form a kind of network in ASEAN. ASEAN not united, it's just united by the common dream and so on. But actually, in business, ASEAN also united by Toyota. <laughs> because if we look at Toyota, uh, some of the engine part is uh, normally from Thailand, the rubber part from, uh, from Malaysia, and uh, some of the electronics normally from Manila, Manila Bay, uh, and the assembling is in Indonesia, and then it's sent either to Africa or Latin America. And, and Australia as well. So uh, ASEAN, I think, uh, should make uh, itself available to be a melting pot of powers that cannot uh, really talk to the others. But if we look at the situation in Morawali, for instance, and this is Indonesia is the largest producer of nickel. And most of the times, uh, if you look at the Morawali, uh, there are very big company. Uh, if we are talking about the new technology of HPAL, uh, HPAL is a technology that changes our low grade nickel into high grade nickel, so it can be used for the battery. So, fifty five percent of the investment on the HPAL technology is actually uh, 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 nuclear industries. Yeah. Uh, nickel industry is a conglomeration of Australian company, Indonesian companies, uh, Chinese companies. And 45% is from Xinjiang. Yeah. So it is something that we uh, offer to the world, uh, despite of the fact uh, of the geopolitical tension. But if you really, you really want to, to make money, uh, we can do things together and profit together. Yeah. <laughs> the other example is that one of my tasks here is to, to, uh, to promote uh, Asian car, Indonesian car into Australian market. Last year was uh, uh, two years ago. We, we managed to have our Fortuner. Uh, it can be Indonesian Fortuners, Toyota Fortuner, or Thailand. If you, you find Fortuner here, it's either made in Indonesia or Thailand. But this year is on electric vehicle, for instance. Yeah. And we have a branch of electric vehicle called uh, Wuling. But Wuling is actually uh, site, uh, General Motors. And and woolly, yeah. So it's again, it's a melting pot of things, yeah. Uh, that can win the price because the price of wooling is only nineteen thousand Australian dollar, as the cheapest uh, car that you might ever have. In here, uh, if you you look at the electric vehicle from a European country, it's mostly three hundred fifty thousand uh, like Jaguar, yeah. Mm -hmm. Or <laughs> this is too much, yeah. Uh, but uh willing this is the the gender motors and and side can give you uh nineteen thousand uh per per unit and and this is a nice car yeah so this is our uh our dream to have it in in australia to help australia uh to 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 get more affordable car because the funny thing about australia is that you don't have car industry but you import it every year one point two 
million car because this is rich people. Uh, mm -hmm. Every every house uh, in the, in the, uh, in, a, in in Canberra they have two garages. Mm -hmm. uh, my house is not made by Indonesia, but by Australia. Have three garages. I only have one car. <laughs> but the point is that 1.2 million cars every year uh, uh, is sold in Australia. Yeah. And your regulation is that 10% of this 1.2 million should be electric vehicle. 10%. That's been 120,000 cars. This is good enough for everyone in ASEAN to start doing business on electric vehicle with Australia. And that's precisely uh, ASEAN has the declaration last year on the ASEAN leaders declaration on electric vehicle and the market of course not only Australia but everywhere now uh, this is a, a nutshell on how Australia can and ASEAN can do things together we need your technology we have a, still a, a demographic bonus yeah uh, in ASEAN but we need more investment on education from Australia. And one of the earliest uh, investment on education from Australia is RMIT. RMIT opened uh, a university and branches in, in, in Vietnam, start with one campus, now they have three campuses in Vietnam. And they helped Vietnam a lot with this STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. And this is the one that really pushed uh, Vietnam uh, manufacturing power up. Yeah. And now we have Monash University in Malaysia, in Indonesia, and uh, Taken University, even uh, the uh, University of Canberra, they have campuses operate as well. Mm -hmm. So this is the kind of investment that Australia can have, win-win, uh, uh, ASEAN, to change our demographic bonus into skill, uh, skill uh, diapers, yes. Uh, I think this is uh, the thing that we can continue with our discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Pastor Scott. We'll turn now to questions, and while people are formulating them, I might get one in myself. Uh, uh, we talked tonight about the future-ready ASEAN economic community. Just wondering what the best way for Australian businesses to access that, bearing in mind that uh, over those uh, 50 years or since ASEAN itself really there must be a web of various uh, agreements and uh, protocols, standards and uh, the like, which is good from ASEAN's point of view in integrating. But uh, how does how does one deal with that web of uh, uh, that regulatory web? And also the question of um, what I understand is the uh, national variations of ASEAN commitments idea, how that uh, can be negotiated. Uh, so the diversity is a pillar of strength, but I just wonder whether it's also a bit of a, a problem in access for outside uh, interests. So I'm not directing that to anyone in particular, but um, Anil, do you want to have a go? Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll take a step at that. Um, first mover advantage, then I can leave the floor to the others. <laughs> oh, yes. um, I think the, the, the best way to go about it, uh, as always, is to have a presence on the ground itself. Um, and I'm not saying that this is unique to, to ASEAN. In any region, if you want to, to develop that economic engagement, uh, it's critical to have a presence on the ground. It's really heartening to see, for example, that uh, we do have many, even state-level representatives uh, operating in our region, um, you know, in terms of forging economic cooperation and links with, with governments. But the critical thing would be to, to build the relationship as, you know, ours is not the only unique region in the world where relationships are very important before the businesses can actually uh, progress. That would be the first step. Second step also is that uh, a lot is made about, oh, you know, when I meet our friends from the business community here, they say, well, you know, we are, we are comfortable in, in Australia, we're very comfortable in Europe, in US and so on less comfortable in Southeast Asia because it's very difficult for us to understand what's going on there in terms of the regulations, in terms of the families who run many businesses and so on. But I think it's also important um, for our Australian friends to help us to understand what goes on in Australia as well. It is two directions. Uh, for example, you know, it's after coming to this appointment that I realized that uh, even in places like Singapore sometimes, we have some difficulty understanding where the lines are drawn between uh, state, between federal, state, and, and council, for example. 
Um, and join the club. Yes. Yeah, uh, yeah. And then Australian friends tell me, yeah, we are also confused sometimes. Right? Mm -hmm. But I think developing that mutual understanding of our respective systems uh, would, would be really very, very uh, critical in terms of having uh, people on the ground as well. All right. Thank you very much. Any other comments? Yeah. So uh, perhaps I'm going to talk more as the <laughs> Australian alumni because <laughs> I've been studying in Australia for eight years and only two years as an ambassador. So as an Australian alumni. Uh, <laughs> in our discussion uh, with I, Lauren, <laughs> debate, for instance, yeah. it's always a, a very classical debate like, Says what? Well, I can bring the horse to the river, but I cannot uh, uh, force the horse to drink. Yeah, just exactly. Uh, we have so many strategies, just do it. Yeah, but the point I told my friend, there are many horses, Chinese horses, American mm -hmm. horses, Japanese horses, all drinking in the same river. And you just stand up there, not drinking. When you start drinking, the water gone. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, you have all the strategy. Uh, and you all the best people uh, to implement it, so just do it. Number two is also the mobility that you mentioned. I think this is quite critical, yeah. Uh, now you have taxonomy made in Australian things. Uh, what you need to have is more labors, yeah, skill one. And before I mentioned that, you invested a lot in Asia for education. I'm a product of Australia, yeah. In Indonesia, we have 250,000 people like me, uh, a graduate from, from Australia, 200, 200,000. Yeah. That's a lot, yeah. A half of the Canberra population. <laughs> it's a study here. I mean, now the point is this, yeah. Uh, it is also time for uh, uh, Indonesia also invest in here and to have the mid in Australian things, you need labor from, skilled labor from Indonesia because of your own product, yeah. But the point is, how easy for them to get through the uh, the, uh, the 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 home affairs minister uh, ministry because all the visa come from there. Yeah, so uh, I met and have a lot of conversation with Roger Roger Q because Roger is start with the downstreaming industry in Western Australia. Yeah, and then we have an agreement last year signed in the Indonesian embassy and it's now part of the strategy is the mutual recognition uh, uh, agreement on engineer, nine cluster of engineer, that your engineer can work with us, uh, our engineer can work here uh, because of the standardization. Now, this is something that we can do together. Yeah, Helping the don't swimming in Australia, you can also help don't swimming in Indonesia. The point will be on this mobility, visa and stuff. Yeah. Thank you very much. Do you show me? No, I think that's, that's all right. All right. So uh, any questions, folks? Gosh, <laughs> so come up. Yes, over here. Uh, thank you. Yes, you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, thank let, you very let, much. Let us know who you are. Um, so my name is Cameron. I'm a, I'm a graduate in the Department of Petroleum and Workplace Relations. Um, thank you all very much, uh, Your Excellencies. Um, I'm just wondering, because we, we talked a lot about the ties with uh, the economic and strategic tie between Australia and ASEAN, but as someone who grew up in Singapore for, for six years, I'm just curious to expand on discussing the what you will see as opportunities to expand um, cultural uh, cultural ties between Australia and ASEAN nations. Right. Yeah, and uh, yes, yeah. So I, I would like, like to respond that. again yeah. as an Australian mm -hmm. alumni. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in 2014, you have a white paper, very nice. It's called Australian in the ASEAN Century. Mm. And that white paper, you promised that by 2025, there will be full access of ASEAN studies in Australia. This is about cultures. And you mentioned four languages, Chinese, Hindi, uh, Indonesia, and Japanese. Yeah. Mm. 2025 is next year. <laughs> now I'm, we are all busy uh, discussing like, uh, the disappearance of uh, ASEAN studies and Australian campuses. Uh, mm -hmm. NESA is going to kill all of the uh, 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 ex ex extension of Indonesian language in New South Wales. And I'm and Greg Ferry are working together to 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 keep it going. Yeah. And 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 then uh, if you see the report, Nicholas Moore report uh, on the on the status of uh, ASEAN studies in Australia, there, they need to to do more. Uh, 
government involvement on that. And uh, I think the new strategy for Southeast Asia cannot work without understanding of the cultures of Southeast Asia. And that's a very big homework, but it's not the first time because 2014, you already have the Australian and ASEAN century, and now you have the new strategy for Southeast Asia, and all much depend on how uh, Asia understand Australia culturally, and Australia understand ASEAN uh, culturally as well. Could I just slip in quickly? Uh, the idea, is there a role for ASEAN itself to be uh, promoting Southeast Asian studies here in Australia? Yes, uh, every every year we provide 40 teaching assistants, for instance, to help all the school here uh, in, in Australia. But again, the point is that they can only stay for three months uh, and then we got to replace with a new teacher. So most of the time our budget is, 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 is spent for the uh, for the aircraft uh, or for the oh, for the yeah. ticket, yeah. If they can stay longer, like six months, it's much much better. Just so we can help. Uh, now in uh, my embassy and Andrew Bar teams, uh, ACP, we are uh, concluding uh, an MOU that we are going to provide twenty uh, teaching assistant for Bahasa Indonesia for Australian public school. Uh, but again, it's much depend on how easy we can bring people here. Yeah. Now, does Singapore or Malaysia have a perspective on the cultural side? Well, well um, on, on the part of Malaysia, of course, we would like to see these cultural exchanges between um, Australia and Malaysia. Um, you are quite right, uh, Pak Siswo, a lot of funding on, uh, for the universities have been slashed. Um, we do have the, um, if you were, the Malaysia Institute um, at the ANU, um, who also faces similar um, issues and therefore is not able to undertake some of the programs and these are but it's uh, it's heartening to know that this university is is trying um, hard to work with um, some universities in Malaysia uh, so that they will be able to undertake some of the um, exchanges mm -hmm. um, with Australia um, you know because cultural exchanges is extremely important because um, understanding like um, uh, High Commissioner Anil mentioned before um, like even when you do business in the economy, uh, you need to understand uh, the cultural sensitivities. How do you approach certain countries? So it, it cuts across the board. Um, to when you deal with people, you need to understand the people, um, irrespective irrespective in uh, whichever field that you are involved in. Yeah. Um, I think uh, from Singapore Australia standpoint, I mean we have a comprehensive strategic partnership bilateral if finished we are almost finishing the first 10 years of that next year we will have the csp 2.0 so the next iteration of this and cultural uh, diplomacy cultural cooperation is a very important part of the csp uh, we have already gone through one run as i said uh, which involves uh, exchanges between museums um, the arts and so on and there will definitely be more cooperation in the second iteration but fundamentally, cultural cooperation is to develop people-to-people -people relations and people-to-people -people understanding. Now, in addition to these cultural projects, I think it's critical for us to ensure that there are significant numbers of young people from both sides who are visiting, and not just visiting for a nice holiday in Bali, yeah, uh, <laughs> for example. Yeah, that's also good. <laughs> yeah, or in Singapore. Uh, for you. Malaysia, of course. But I think more importantly to actually live uh, as our students do in Australia, mm -hmm. which I think, as I said, provide, has provided that bedrock for that relationship. We need to have more young uh, Australian friends coming to our part of the world, living there, working there, spending time, building those friendships. Uh, and I think this is something that I, I, I hope uh, that both sides can, can really put their minds to to see how else we can stimulate that. Just got a question here about the uh, new Centre for Southeast Asian Studies announced at the summit in March. Uh, I think that's the one at the ANU, is it? Or is that separate again? Um, we're not sure about that, but, um, or maybe... Uh, yeah, we think our Australian friends to, to tell us how it's been. Oh, right, yes. Well, maybe we could have a, a, a discussion about that particular initiative offline. Now, turn to Ernst for the next question. Thank you, Ernst. Well, I'm a member of the branch. Thank you. Each of you feel very comprehensive survey of things here. Some limited 
make sure we have that security that it hasn't been a major feature of your presentations. We in Australia were surprised, I think it's fair to say, when the Morrison government announced the acquisition of the nuclear, nuclear propellant plants. This was kept in the secret. Um, many people see these as not being really relevant to defence, but to attack. They're designed to attack another country, and we wondered about the reasons for that. There was no prior consultation with our neighbours. Um, my question essentially is, what does the what is the reaction of each of the countries to this enlargement of Australia's wartime capabilities, and how do you see the security situation along with? Well, who would like to start on that? Security side. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, I'll, yeah I'll, sure. I'll, I'll make a, make a go. I think, uh, of course, like everybody else, when the announcement came out, uh, the details were new to Singapore as well. Um, and uh, initially, I understand that there were a lot of complaints about um, the lack of consultation um, and so on. Um, since then, uh, especially under the current government, I think uh, the Australian government has taken great pains uh, and effort to uh, not so much consult, but to share with us uh, some of the developments related to AUKUS uh, almost in real time. Uh, and I think uh, whatever our views are on AUKUS within ASEAN, and when I say we as in different countries, I think what we all appreciate is the fact that the current government is making a real effort to uh, engage and to share with us what underpins the push to occur. And we appreciate that. From Singapore's standpoint, I think what we have focused on is, number one, Australia is a very important partner, friend, and player in terms of regional security. It has been, and as far as Singapore's history is concerned, definitely, and continues to be so. So that's the first, first point. Second point is that um, the basis on which AUKUS uh, is, stands is the fact that it is supposed to enhance regional security, uh, international security in general, but regional security as well. If, this, if that is the stated goal, definitely Singapore would support any initiative which supports regional security and creates a stable environment for us in which all of us can continue to grow and develop together. Of course, there is an issue related to uh, nuclear uh, safety because these are going to be nuclear-powered submarines. Uh, on that score, again, we have seen Australia make a very strong effort to work with the uh, IAEA and other friends and partners to make sure that there is a clear understanding of what this entails and what this is not. And we appreciate that as well. And we will continue to work with our Australian friends in fora like IAEA and so on to make sure that the safety aspect of this is also uh, uh, adequately looked at. Any other views there? Yes, yeah. sure. Hmm. Well, for, for Malaysia, um, but Malaysia and Asia, um, we have always maintained that this region should be a region of peace, a zone of peace. So with regards to AUKUS, um, of course, we have expressed our concern um, that we do not want the, you know, for it to trigger any, um, arms race of, of that sort. So um, like what uh, High Commissioner Anil had mentioned, um, that Australia needs to be transparent in what it does. So, um, you know, so um, that peace and stability in the region is extremely important. And what we want is we respect what Australia wants to do, um, but then we have to be careful that it doesn't trigger any arms race um, within the region. Thank you. Okay. John. Um... Now, well, two main questions to you. First, uh, could you please give us an ASEAN perspective insofar as it's possible to have such a perspective on the end of the Russia, on, in the, on the end of the Washington consensus? And the linked issue of what are ASEAN perceptions of what might happen with the change of administration in the United States. Two actually, two questions do go together, but I'd be interested in the views. Yeah, uh, we have experience uh, uh, 
the transition uh, from Obama into uh, into Trump and Trump to uh, to Biden. Yeah. Uh, it's much also to do and how uh, the United States relation with with China. Yeah, uh, there are two things here. At that times, uh, the transitions uh, it's not always bad because we enjoy a lot of windfall. Yeah, <laughs> the windfall because of the trade war. So we I still remember when uh, Trump called of the American companies to out from China mm -hmm. and back to America, only less than uh, 5%, I think, really go back to America, but m most of them, they stay in ASEAN. So that's why uh, part of the increasing uh, uh, ASEAN investment from America is also from that. Yeah. Uh, but uh, we also notice that uh, ASEAN is also a place when uh, American leaders talk with the uh, Chinese leaders. If you still remember in Bali, they managed to talk about that. Yeah. So we are going to continue that role, I think, uh, as far as we can. Uh, yeah, so some, this is my comment. Any other comments on the Washington consensus? Um, well, I think that the that... general answer to, to that would be that uh, in America, the outcome of the, the coming election, as with all the elections, would have, uh, of course, a lot of implications for the rest of the world and for the rest of us. There's, there's always always been the case. Some known, some unknown, some predictable, some, some less so. And with the electoral college system that they have, uh, obviously, uh, it's what turns in a few critical states that has a lot of bearing for what's going to happen to all of us. Uh, what can we do about it? Well, we can't influence the, the outcome of the U.S. election and how the uh, American voters would make that decision. But what we can do is to prepare for various scenarios. What we have experienced during the first Trump presidency, not to say there's going to be a second one, what would happen, um, would be the same thing. But of course, also, if there is a continuation of the Biden presidency, what to expect and what might change. We can make some contingencies. We can we have, I'm sure, all of our governments do some scenarios. And I think we then use that to, to chart our way forward. Ultimately, we are, we are price takers in this. What we can do is to prepare and to adapt our plans uh, going forward. Sharina, anything? No, okay. So time for two more questions. I'll take one from Ross and then Desmond. Thank you. On Ross, you know, um, a former DPO officer did a posting in Jakarta a long time ago, and uh, I like to endorse what Pakistan is like said about Darwin. It is Australia's Department of Southeast Asia. I think that's, that's really what it is. Um, but I want to ask about, about Timor Leste. Um, I was involved in uh, setting up a Australian aid projects um, in the Indonesian days, where it's been more. We worked with Papa Nash and put some projects on the ground. And later on, uh, I did the same thing with Timor Leste. Uh, and uh, I'm still a little bit involved uh, with Timor Leste. And I'm wondering, I know that Timor Leste are uh, keen to join us in. Um, but we have had observer status for a while now. Um, and I'd be interested in your your views, or each of your views, on the sort of the pros and cons and what's driving this, and what would be good or bad for us in. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, take your question now, Desmond, if you could be. Oh, thank you. Um, I think the uh, Desmond Woods, councillor of this branch, the um, the ASEAN elephant in the room for the last three years has been the military dictatorship in Myanmar, and um, I understand that ASEAN respects the right of individual states to pursue their own policies, uh, but uh, it does violate most of the founding principles of ASEAN, that there should be a government there which has uh, suborned the will of the people, overturned the democratic government, uh, imprisoned large numbers of the people who would in normal circumstances be running the country and fought a war against its own younger generation. Um, is there a bilateral relationship between each ASEAN country and Myanmar, or is there a policy position on how the military junta should be being dealt with. 
All right, we might go to the first question on uh, uh, Timor-Leste uh, joining ASEAN and then come back to the question about Myanmar. Who, who would like to make a comment on those things? Sadie? Well, uh, on Timor-Leste, um, you know, we are supportive of them joining ASEAN, uh, you know, if there is already a consensus. And I think it's just a matter of time. I'm not uh, actually sure when would be the date of them joining ASEAN. So, yeah. But that, I mean, that would be a fairly smooth process for us. We already yeah. participated in some. Yes, yeah. as observer. So Absolutely. yeah, I, I guess the 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 way to look at it is if it's a membership to a to a club, there are obviously certain membership rules that uh, that you have to fulfill. Not just for entry, but after you have entered, uh, to make sure that there are certain commitments that member states have to make. Uh, basic things like how, the meetings that you have to attend, the follow-up that you need to do, and so on. So any aspiring member would have to do a real stock take to say, are, are they in a position to be able to do that? Uh, so as far as the other ASEAN members are concerned, as uh, Sharina said, there is a consensus to say, well, when Timor Leste is ready, they can join us. And all of us individually and collectively are helping Timor Leste uh, to develop their capacity to be able to be a, a responsible and contributing um, ASEAN member. Um, so we are waiting uh, Timor Leste's own uh, decision in terms of when they will they feel that they would be ready uh, to join us. Um, and in the meantime, they continue to join some of our discussions and some of our, our initiatives. And the hard question for last uh, on my end. The uh, ASEAN, I think, already have a, a, a principle on the who can participate from the Myanmar uh, side in our meeting. Yeah. What's it called? Like a non, non political. Yeah, non political representation. So we're still engaging with uh, Myanmar. And I know as well that uh, whoever the ASEAN uh, chair, they have also open a uh, uh, channel of communication with every party uh, in, in, in Myanmar. It might take longer time than expected, but this will. Uh, uh, the, the dialogue and communication uh, has been very, very intensified. During uh, uh, what I know is during Indonesian chairmanship, uh, Minister Ratno Marsuti have a lot of contacts uh, with either uh, uh, the, the one outside Myanmar or within Myanmar uh, among the different factions. Yeah. Any other views? No. All right. Well, look, we've covered a lot of ground tonight, uh, ladies and gentlemen. We might draw a line under it there. Mm -hmm. And uh, thank our uh, distinguished guests for covering very much ground indeed on the business, security and culture fronts of ASEAN and ASEAN-Australia relations. So as a token of a uh, small token of appreciation, I'd like to present each of our speakers with uh, a little memento of their coming. Thank Serena, you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you. Now, ladies and gentlemen, uh, that uh, finishes for tonight, but our next uh, meeting of the ACT branch of the AIIA is in fact next week on Wednesday when we have uh, Professor Jocelyn Che from the University of Technology, Sydney, who's coming to give us a worm's eye view of China. So I hope you can join us for that. Good evening.